Welcome to the How to Lead Innovation in Your Organization webinar, which will be presented by Jonathan Vihar of the Center for Creative Leadership. My name is Tracy Dobbins. I'm an event manager at the Center for Creative Leadership, also known as ECL, and I will serve as the host for today's webinar. ECL is recognized as a top provider of leadership development worldwide. We accelerate strategies and business results by unlocking individual and organizational leadership potential through an array of programs, products, and other services. We hope you enjoy today's session and find it a valuable leadership development tool for you and your organization. This program will last 60 minutes. But before I turn the session over to Jonathan, I'd like to show our live audience how to communicate with us during the webinar. We invite you to interact with us utilizing the chat tool provided on the right side of your screen. Send them to your question or comment and direct it to all participants, and we will respond at the end of the session in the order that they are received. You can also communicate directly with me by directing your uh, comment or question to host presenter. I like that. We will include a few audience polls in today's session and an evaluation of the conclusion and ask you to participate by clicking your answer choice and then clicking on the submit button. If you have a group viewing the webinar with you today, please just take a consensus of the group and make one response. In your confirmation emails, you receive the link to the course materials, and we hope you have printed these out. Materials include information about our presenter and a copy of its presentation, as well as a white paper on innovation. Now I'd like to turn the webinar over to Jonathan Bihar, who is a senior faculty member at the Center for Creative Leadership. Welcome to the Leading Effectively webinar series, Jonathan. Thanks, Tracy. It's good to be here. Uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is for you right now. Um, we are going to talk today about how to lead innovation in your organization, and we'll create the distinction between leading innovation and uh, basically operational leadership. So not just management, not just leadership, but the leadership of innovation, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Here's how we're going to cover this. Uh, we're going to start with... Uh, well, we'll start with an introduction, because that's a good place to start. Uh, and then we will jump right into the innovation game. So get ready to get ready to play. Uh, after we do that, we'll start to talk about defining our terms, because as somebody famous once said, words mean something. Um, and so we'll take a look at what do they actually mean as we talk about leadership and innovation and how all that stuff fits together. We'll also talk about how to evaluate new ideas because that's a key process uh, when you think about how to uh, be a leader trying to drive innovation in your organization. We'll talk about how to reframe the challenge, and uh, we'll give you the opportunity for Q&A via the chat box. And uh, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to add those into the chat box, uh, as Tracy just instructed you. Uh, we'll also give you a little bit of time at the end uh, for some Q&A, uh, assuming uh, assuming all goes well, and why not? Let's assume that. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, I once spoke at a conference, and uh, the presenter uh, who was introducing me said, and now a man who needs no introduction, and then he walked off stage. Um, so just to make sure that everybody knows uh, who I am, so here's a little bit about me. So as Tracy mentioned, I'm senior faculty at CCL. Um, I've got about 20 years of experience in creative thinking and innovation leadership. This has been the area that I have been focused on for uh, a long time. I'm fascinated by it. I get very passionate about it. Sometimes I speak too quickly about it. Uh, and if that's the case today, then I apologize. But this is the thing that really uh, is fascinating to me, especially through the innovation, uh, excuse me, especially through the leadership lens. Um, so I've worked with a bunch of different uh, organizations, everything from Fortune 100 to government to high tech to not for profit organizations. Um, so I'm going to keep my comments broad because I know that we have people from all of those sorts of organizations as well as educational uh, institutions which I've also done to work with. So um, I view myself as both a trainer and a consultant around the area of organizational development. Um, and uh, probably the, the most important uh, role in my life that really challenges my creativity and my innovation on a regular basis is being the father of a nearly three-year-old. Um, holy cow, uh, boy, has that taken my game to a new level or helped me realize that I really need to take my game to a whole new level. So. Speaking of three-year-olds, uh, let's play a little game here. This is the innovation game. 
Uh, and this is literally the innovation game. So it's not a metaphor, but this is really a game that we'll play uh, all here together online. And here's the way it's going to work. So I'm going to share with you four beverage concepts, uh, which may or may not make this a drinking game. You decide. Um, and once I share those four concepts with you, um, I'm going to we'll post a poll and give you the opportunity to decide which which one or which ones are uh, actual products in the marketplace. They really exist. Uh, and which one or which ones are fake? They may not actually exist anywhere. So um, that's the game. You get to choose, is it real or is it fake? And so here are the concepts. I'll walk through them uh, all four, and then we'll put up the poll to give you an opportunity to choose. So concept number one is uh, uh, it's wine, the kind that you would drink, made with real mice. Mm -hmm. That's concept number one, wine made with real mice. Concept number two is beer overtly branded uh, or marketed to children. Concept number three is a human blood beverage for devotees of the Twilight movie series, you know, the vampire movie series, a human blood beverage for vampire fans. And number four is water, especially for dieters. All right, so those are the four concepts. Um, that's about all I'm going to tell you about them. Again, the game is, is it real or is it fake? And so, um, Tracy, I'll ask you to put up the poll now, if you would, please. Okay, the poll comes up here on your right. And just respond to each one of the questions. And again, if you have a group, just uh, take a consensus of the group quickly and make one response. So the results are coming in now. Should I say they're pouring in? All my beverages? Sorry. They're coming in. Do in progress here. We'll keep it open for a little bit longer. So quickly submit your response. We have and there's four questions there. How about two thirds of the responses? Good. Last one's coming in. All right. Last minute. Closing the poll right about now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, about uh, 15 seconds. These last ones to come in, and we'll share the responses with everybody. Good. So we'll uh, we'll put these up, and uh, we'll get a sense of uh, where the where the group is with these. Where you thought we were uh, telling the truth, and where you thought we were not telling the truth. You should see the results right about now. Okay. Coming up. So, um, those are the results that are up there. You should see them now. Uh, and if we go through these, so number one, uh, wine made with real mice. Uh, so, it looks like um, a little more than half the people said that that was fake. Um, fewer people said that it was real. Uh, beer overtly branded or marketed to children. Um, a lot of people said that one was real. Um, about the same number of said wine made with mice was real, said beer is fake. So uh, we have human blood beverage uh, for vampire fans, um, pretty even split, real or fake, and water made for dieters. A lot of folks said that's absolutely real. Not many people said that one was fake. So uh, those are the results. The question that we probably should have asked is how many of you think that they're all real or how many of you think that they're all fake? Um, but I didn't want you to think that we were setting you up. Um, so let's do this. Let's go through the correct answers and uh, and let you know how you did. And you can keep score and see if you were 100% uh, correct or not. Not that there's a prize for that, mind you, except for the satisfaction of knowing that you succeeded at the game. So here's the real answer. So uh, we'll talk about the first concept, baby mice wine. It turns out um, that there is a product where they take newborn mice and they drop them into a bottle of wine. The wine is then sealed, bottled, and labeled. It's said to be a miraculous cure for just about whatever ails you, and this product is, in fact, sold in China and Korea. Uh, however, I hasten to add, you will not find this in Disneyland anytime soon. Mickey is not in the bottle. So this one is, in fact, a real product. The second product. Uh, this is from a company called Sangaria. Uh, it's a product called Kodomono Nomimono. Um, it's bottled uh, in a beer bottle, um, and it, it's a product that looks just like beer. It's for children. It's flavored like apple juice, however, and it creates a foamy top that leaves a foam mustache for children of all ages. And uh, if you're offended by this concept, don't worry. They also make a plum wine and a sake for children. So this one also really exists. 
Talk about concept number three. Uh, this product called diet water. So if you're having trouble finding a zero-calorie beverage without any flavoring, the good news is now there's diet water. Turns out that the Japanese beverage giant Sapporo has been selling diet water since 2005. Now, if you're curious about the magical ingredients that will help you not gain weight by drinking this product, the contents are, well, water. Um, so that's also real. And now let's talk about vampire nectar. When will the vampire craze stop? There's TV shows, there's movies, now there's beverages, right? Vampire nectar looks like and tastes like human blood because it is human blood. Uh, it turns out that whole blood is pasteurized to make it safe and then bottled for vampire fans. And it's become a cult beverage of choice among people who have watched too many Twilight movies. I should hasten to add, not really. Don't go looking for this on your store shelves. This one is, in fact, fake. So if we had to go in there for a little while, uh, I apologize for that. Um, so that's the innovation game. Um, I don't know how many of you got those answers 100% correct. Um, but that's not the point, right? The point of this has to do with how do we treat new ideas. And so I'm going to ask you in your chat box to just input your response to the question that's on the screen up there now, which is what was your immediate response to the new ideas? You may have thought about it. You may have processed it. Um, but what was your immediate first response to the new ideas? If you would take a moment in your chat box and just answer that question, um, then um, we'll read those off to you. Again, it's sent to all participants, and then everybody can share in it. Yeah, they're flying in now. <laughs> Good. A million-dollar ideas. Ew. It's not for me. Are you kidding me? It's crazy. Really? Um, negative, distaste, um, but amusing. Some people cringing, skeptical, some cultural responses, questions about who would want to buy that. Um some are more disgusting than others. Wondering what the market will bear. Um, really crazy. Just shocked, disgusting. Bad ideas. One out of four makes sense. <laughs> OMG. That's very nice. Good. Uh, UGH. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's Pug. Um, <laughs> this is an idiot born every minute. The poor mice. People are incredibly gullible. So uh, it seems to me, and Tracy checked me on this, but it seems to me that most of the reaction is, holy cow, that's a really bad idea. Um, in general, there are some folks who took a different look at it, but in general, most of the response was negative. And here's the thing that's really important about innovation leadership in terms of leading innovation in the organization is that most times – when we come to somebody or a group with a new idea, a lot of the times the response is the same. It's skeptical. It's negative. It's a are you crazy response because by definition, new ideas are unusual. They're strange. They're different. We've never seen them before. And they don't fit into our concept of what's out there in the world. Um, and so... Really, what the challenge is around leading innovation is to be open to those new ideas, and not just to be open to them, but to be deliberate about searching for the value in all of those new ideas that we're working with to make sure that we're not missing the next big opportunity, the next big opportunity. So we'll come back to that, but first, I'd like to define our terms. So uh, words mean something. So here's a couple of definitions. And in any of these words that I'm going to share with you, there's a lot of different definitions. But here's a few working definitions. So uh, I mentioned earlier creativity and innovation. Here's a couple of definitions around creativity that, uh, that I particularly like. So one of them is the ability to overcome self-imposed limitations. And so if you take a look back at some of those odd concepts, some of those limitations that we place on ourselves um, are limitations that we self-impose, right? So some of these concepts are, in fact, cultural. Um, and so depending on which culture you come from, some of those things may be ridiculous, offensive, unusual, silly, but in other cultures they may make perfect sense. And so we put limitations on ourselves. Um, and so when we can overcome those self-imposed limitations, that's when creativity can happen. Creativity is also uh, it's a process that results in a novel work that's accepted as useful by a significant group of people at some point in time. 
Right? So a couple of different definitions of creativity that are that will be helpful in framing our discussion. Different from innovation, in terms of innovation, a uh, definition that my colleague David Horst and I uh, created for a, for a white paper is uh, it's implementing something new that adds value or quantifiable gain, and that requires many skill sets, usually a team. So as we think about organizational innovation or innovation that requires leadership, meaning there's a bunch of people involved, that means we've got a, we need many skills that usually requires a team, and so innovation uh, is a team sport. Creativity, not all the time, but innovation is almost always a team sport. That requires you to work with other folks to figure out something new that's going to add value or quantifiable gain. Uh, I mentioned the white paper. Um, these are, of course, as Tracy mentioned, uh, these links were sent to you. Um, if you download that white paper uh, and if you print it on blue paper, you will have a blue white paper, but you know what? This is about innovation and creativity, so that's okay. You can print it on whatever color paper you like. So continuing to define our terms, a uh, definition of leadership that we really like around here at CCL is a process by which an individual or group creates direction, alignment, and commitment around a specific goal or outcome. And those three things of direction, alignment, commitment, really important. That's how you know leadership is showing up when that's happening. And then tying it all together, innovation and leadership, uh, mushing those two things together to figure out what do we mean by innovation and leadership, we're talking about a process for creating direction, alignment, and commitment um, that's needed to create and implement something new that adds value. Right? So essentially, we're trying to create something new. We're trying to add value or quantifiable gain in the organization. That requires the leaders to create direction, alignment, and commitment. So those are, those are our terms. And how it all fits together, uh, essentially, you can think about it this way. Is that creative thinking leads to creativity, and the implementation of creativity leads to innovation. And, of course, the thing that ties all of that together is that we uh, need to be leaders in order to make that happen. We need to make sure that there is clear direction, alignment, and commitment in order to bring that innovation out there to the marketplace, out there to your customers, your clients, whoever your constituency is. Um, Teresa Amable, who's a researcher at Harvard, um, says it this way. says, all innovation begins with creative ideas. Creativity is necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for innovation. So creativity is important, but it's more than that. That's where we need to think about the implementation. That's why leadership is so critical. So a um, couple other things to just define for you, and that's the definition or the difference between leadership and management, right? And so if you think about management, the stuff that you learn at, uh, at any good business school um, – Basically, it's about predictability, it's about order, key results, controlling, compliance, staffing, all that sort of stuff, problem solving. Leadership is different than management. We're going to argue that leadership is about producing dramatic and useful change. It's motivation, it's inspiring, it's aligning, it's being about proactive and finding opportunities as opposed to problem solving. So there's this, there's this discrepancy here, this difference between these two words, not to say that one is better than the other, they're both very important, right? So these are things where we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing at the right time. In general, management is important for innovation, but leadership is really important for bringing those newness, uh, that newness to the marketplace, however you define your market. So we've got that distinction between leadership and management. Very similar to that is the distinction between innovative thinking and business thinking. Business thinking is about results, not about ambiguity. There is a right and a wrong. It's about making quick decisions, logical, proof, deductive reasoning. Innovative thinking is different. Innovative thinking is not about so much results. Of course, it's about results eventually, but it's much more about meaning. Innovation flourishes when there's ambiguity uh, that we can hold. So it really relishes the ambiguity because the more we can tolerate that ambiguity, the more innovation shows up. It's always a better way. That's what innovative, uh, innovative thinking is all about. It's about asking what if. It's about using your intuition rather than your logic. And so, again, it's not to say that one is right and one is wrong. They're both very important. What we need to do is make sure that we're making some smart choices about when we use innovative thinking versus when do we use business thinking. So let's think a little bit about this in terms of how do we apply this. And so 
going to put up a poll uh, in a moment, and so you can see up here, uh, we're going to ask you three questions. So I'd like you to think about whether it's business thinking or whether it's innovative thinking. So when we've got developing a new product concept, um, is that an example of business thinking or innovative thinking? When we talk about developing uh, a business model, is that a business thinking or innovative thinking? When we're talking about strategies to improve the customer experience, is that business thinking or innovative thinking? So we're going to put that poll uh, up for you now so that uh, you can start to vote. I see the voting has begun. Results are pouring in now. Results pouring in doesn't make as much sense when I'm not talking about numbers. Just so. Running in. Pouring for us slowly. What about the of you that are sitting talking with some other teammates. So we've closed the polling. Uh, we're tallying up the polls right now. Tracy is counting as quickly as she can. And uh, we'll see those results in a moment. And uh, before those results come in, I'd just like to let you know that I've set you up a bit. So this is actually a bit of a gotcha uh, activity because in all of these examples, whether it's new products or business models or strategies to improve the customer service, all three of those require both. They require business thinking uh, and innovative thinking. And so, in a sense, we kind of set you up there. Um, so those of you that didn't provide an answer, uh, that may be because you couldn't decide, and you may be right. Um, and so, in essence, this is a trick question. It really requires both of those things, both in terms of business thinking and innovative thinking, the innovative thinking to really make sure that we can come up with some of those interesting new product concepts or different business models or strategies to improve the customer experience. And then we need some business thinking to really make sure that we're implementing those things so that they are smart, so that they're profitable, so that they're providing good value. Um, we need both of those items. So, again, just a way to reinforce that it's not one or the other, but it's really about both. So, forgive me for setting you up. Uh, I apologize for that. A bit of a gotcha um, to cement the point that this is about making sure that we've got both of these things in the organization because you can't be successful with one versus the other. You need to be able to apply both. So, let's talk a little bit about how do we evaluate new ideas. How do we evaluate new ideas? And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'd like to share a concept with you. This is a concept for a new idea. Um, and I'm just going to ask for your comments, and we'll use the chat box for that again. And so here's the idea. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great new vending machine idea. And what will happen is into this vending machine, into the machine, you put your quarters um, and your dollar bills, your coins, whatever, as well as your dog. And then your dog gets washed and dry, all in the vending machine. So that's, uh, that's, our, that's our great idea uh, of the day. What I'd like you to do is in the chat box, I'd like you to just submit your comments about that idea. Submit your comments about that idea. <laughs> so results are coming in now. Um, I'm all in, and so is my dog. Uh, where do I sign up? Um, so I'm terrified for this. Less trauma, less mess. <laughs> uh, this is works for kids. Um, great, great. Sounds great if you can keep the dog preoccupied. Thank you, Kay. Might make millions. Great, poor puppies. My dog loves anything that involves water. A different dog than I do. Uh, ruh <laughs> Very nice. Someone's calling the people for the ethical treatment of animals. Um, Going to need a big machine, and we have small to medium uh, options. Does it work for cats? The ASPCA is coming in there. Um, I want the same dog back. Seems very convenient. Might be hard to implement and keep safe. Um, she needs to be totally transparent. Great. <laughs> a lot of people interested in this concept for their kids. I understand that. I wish there weren't such a thing for my child. Um, great. So we've got a bunch of responses in here, and uh, you'll notice that 
when should I expect a call from the lawyers? Um, good. So you'll notice that there are some folks in there who said, hey, this seems like a really interesting idea, and there are some folks out there who had some real significant concerns about this, both in terms of safety and in terms of how we treat the dog. Um, my guess is, is that we probably had, would have had even more negative responses if we hadn't played the innovation drinking game earlier. Um, and so... What tends to happen is new ideas seem strange, and so we are quick to provide judgment either that it's right or that it's wrong, that it's good or that it's bad, um, and in fact, that misses the point a little bit, because what we're not looking to do is to create judgment, but we're looking to first understand that, and yes, I ask you for your comments, um, and I ask you for your judgment. Here's where we should go first, though, right? So one of the things we want to do when we treat new ideas is we want to look to understand those ideas and start to evaluate that using a technique that we call praise first. We also call it POINT. Um, POINT is an acronym um, because uh, if you're like us, you don't have enough acronyms in your organization and you'd like another one. So POINT is an acronym that stands for the following thing. Number one, pluses. In other words, what's good now? So as we look at the idea of the vending machine that will clean our dog, um, essentially, what's good about that idea? What do you like about it? Next thing we want to look for is the opportunities. So what might be some of the good ideas in the future? So if we were to take that idea, build the vending machine for cleaning dogs, and put it out there in the marketplace, what might be some of the good things that might result? Then we take a look at the issue, right? What's not right yet? In other words, what are the things that are limitations? What are the things that aren't quite perfect about it right now? And we're going to phrase those issues as questions. We're going to phrase it starting with how to or how might or in what ways might. And the reason that we phrase it as a question is we want to be very deliberate about asking for new solutions, right? We don't just want to say, hey, here's where it's wrong and that's a showstopper. We want to say, what are some ways that we can improve this to fix the issues to make that idea even better? Once we've identified those issues, we take those most important issues and we apply some new thinking. So P for pluses, O for opportunities, I for issues, NT for new thinking. Um, that's a technique to make sure we're searching for the value in all new ideas, which is one of those things I mentioned earlier is a key skill for innovation leadership. So that's a technique. That's a way to make sure that you're not looking at new ideas and just discounting them and killing the next big idea, um, which could be the next, you know, iPad. Right? How many people uh, have tried to do the tablet that didn't work until we got one that seems to be catching on the market by storm? I'm not advocating iPads right now. I'm just saying um, that they're selling a lot of them. So how do we make sure we don't just kill that next new idea? That's one way to do it. So let's give it a try. So let's uh, let's apply this point process by starting with pluses. Um, so again, it's a great new vending machine idea. Into the machine, you put your quarters and your dog. The dog gets washed and dried. Tell me what you like about this idea. What are the pluses of this idea? Would you take a moment to type your answers into the chat box? So whether or not you have concerns, what do you like about the idea? So convenience, it's quick and efficient, it's easy. It's fast, uh, keeps the bathroom clean, the owner stays dry, there's less mess, um, it's tidy, the dog shakes inside, um, it sounds inexpensive, there's no need to schedule, um, can use known technology, there's no fur in your drain, no wet dog smell, I hear that one, it entertains the dog, it's available on demand. Solves common problems in washing the dog. Great. So there's a lot of pluses about this idea I hear out there. Profitable, standardized process. Nice. Nice. So those are the pluses. Nice job, folks. You've done a really good job of identifying some of the good things about this idea. So let's go to the next part of the process, and let's take a look at the opportunities. Right? So same idea, vending machine idea. Dog, your quarters, they go in, the dog gets washed and dried. What are the opportunities that might exist in the future if this idea were implemented? And I'd like you to start it with it might. So what are some of the good things that it might do? Not the bad things, not the issues, but what are some of the good things that it might do? So it might work with a debit card so you don't have to carry all those quarters, right? It might work with kids. Um, it might cut their nails. It might be adaptable for cats or other small animals. It might replace human showers. Uh, might be an opportunity to introduce the line of pricey shampoos. It might end flea problems. It might produce franchise opportunities. 
It might make me rich. It might reduce stress. It might work for bikes. Uh, it might provide different scents and soaps. I might be able to use it in campgrounds. It might be eco-friendly. It might be really profitable. Um, I might be able to clean sports equipment. Um, it might offer sales for pet supplies. It might be able to be used for other animals. So great. It might be able to reduce water. So a whole bunch of different, uh, whole different ideas. It might work on college campuses. I like that. Uh, so there's some good things that might show up if this idea were, in fact, implemented. So nice job there, folks. Um, so good way of sort of looking into the future. Pluses, here's what's good about it, here's what we know, opportunities, good things in the future, a future orientation to make sure that we're considering the possibilities, even if the idea is not yet perfect. Um, nice, and it might allow us to wash mice before putting them in wine. Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about some of the issues. This is a nice connection there, by the way. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, so the application of point, let's talk about issues. So again, the same concept, vending machine to wash a dog. What are some of the issues with this idea? And I'd really like you to phrase those issues starting with a question, phrasing it as a how-to or how might or in what ways might. So if you think, hey, this may injure the dogs, that's a possibility. So phrase it as a question. How might we make sure the dogs don't get injured? Or how might we keep the dogs safe? Or how might we keep the pets safe? Um, other things that are shown on, um, how might we make sure PETA is happy? Uh, how might we make sure it's, uh, it's safe? Boy, there's a theme showing up there. Uh, how to manage the crowds? How might uh, we keep the dogs calm? How to handle the wastewater? Um, how to keep soap out of the dog's eyes? Uh, how might we uh, make it work for uh, dogs of different sizes? How might we make sure the dog can breathe during the wash? Um, how might we make sure that Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, is comfortable with this idea? Um, uh, <laughs> how might we make sure the dog doesn't drown? How might we accept credit cards? Um, good. How might how might we make sure no one puts their kids in there? How might we make the owner comfortable? Good. So a lot of a lot of issues there, a lot of concerns. So where we would go next with this is we basically start to take a look at. What is some new thinking to apply to those most important issues? So new thinking. So there seems to be a theme in there of how to ensure the dog's safety. So now, in the chat box, same idea, what are some ideas that you might be able to come up with for how to ensure the dog's safety? Would you take a moment and into the chat box, type your answers in there, um, and they're starting to show up already. So keep the head of the dog uh, outside of the machine. Provide a window. Uh, make sure that there's a kill switch. Uh, put in safety straps. Sedate the dog. Sedate the owner. Uh, allow the owner to override. Um, safety goggles for the dog, I assume. Um, provide a harness. Make sure there's good airflow. Um, <laughs> maybe not a kill switch. Maybe that's a poor choice of words. Make sure there's a safety switch. Positioning. Um, but make sure that there's a bike toy or a play toy for the dog inside there. Put the donor, the owner in with the dog. That'll ensure safety. Um, multi-size scuba. Make sure that there's a cool, dry option. Uh, no alcohol allowed near the dog. <laughs> Putting in place temperature control. Great. So uh, make sure that there are attendants. Melted the concept of Dyson, the auto eject button that's operational by the dog. <laughs> I love it. So nice, creative, innovative thinking there, folks. So nice job. So notice what happened uh, as we're going through here. So we've gone through the process of essentially taking a look at an idea which on its surface seems a little bit odd and strange. Um, and we've gone through the process of being very deliberate about saying, Here's what we like about it. Here's some good things that might result. Hey, this idea is not perfect yet. There are some issues. And then we apply some new thinking to make sure that we're improving that idea, to make that idea even better. Here's one of the things that I find fascinating about this. When we're doing, uh, when we're doing training programs in innovation leadership, one of the things that we'll do is we'll have participants come up with the wildest, strangest idea that they can possibly come up with. And then we'll say, okay, so that's a crazy idea. Let's apply this point technique to it. Let's apply praise for us. Let's look at the pluses, the opportunities, the issues, and the new thinking to this crazy idea and see what happens. 
in every time, and I mean every time, by taking the craziest idea we can think of and applying the point process, we end up with some really interesting and unique ideas that are, that, that are in fact, practical um, and that actually make some sense. So this point approach uh, is a good way of taking an idea that you think is nuts um, and turning it into an idea that's really valuable and useful that is, in fact, innovation. And so this is an important skill for innovation leaders. By the way, um, the dog uh actually exists. This is a $30,000 machine that's designed by veterinarians and engineers. Um, what you do, you put your dog into the machine. The dog goes through a four-minute wash, a 30-second rinse, and a 20-minute dry. Prices start at about 20 bucks. Uh, and the last time I checked, the Easy Wash location in Vancouver sees about 150 dogs per month. Um, and you can search this on YouTube if you want to see how this wa uh, see how this works and see the dog's reaction. By the way, dogs like this idea a lot more than cats do. Um, and I've seen the video, and that's all I want to say about that, because PETA may be listening. So we're the SPCA. By the way, I'm a dog and a cat lover, so I'm an advocate of safety. That being said, here's what this is all about. This is not about how do you wash your dog. This is about how do you lead innovation. So why would you use point? So this is a technique useful for looking for the value in new ideas. Um, it's a fair and respectful way to evaluate ideas. It's not about being nice. It's about being fair. It's about being respectful. It's about recognizing that the people that you work with are smart folks. They've got good ideas. You may not understand the value of those ideas at first, and so they may seem weird or strange or odd, but this is a fair and respectful way to look for the value in those new ideas. It's also a deliberate technique to train yourself and to avoid those snap judgments, which can sometimes be wrong judgments. In essence, it's an investment in developing your people and your organization. New ideas always seem strange. This is, by definition, what happens. So it requires work on the part of the leader, right? So, yeah, this is work. Yes, this is hard. And that's why you, the leader, that's why you get paid the big bucks. It's about making sure that you're doing the work to see the value in those new ideas. Um, one of the great philosopher kings of our, our era, I once saw an interview, um, and this person said, ideas are like children. Your own are great. Implying that all of the other ones are weird and unusual and strange and loud and sticky and get underfoot. So if your own ideas are great, that means that everybody who's sharing an idea with you sees a great idea in it. And if you don't see it, if I don't see it, if we don't see it initially, then we're going to miss a big opportunity. So that's why this point technique is so valuable in terms of looking for the pluses, looking for the, op uh, the opportunities, identifying those issues, and then fixing those issues. That's why we want to use point. Um, and this is the hard work of being a leader is being very deliberate about that. Um, now, when I talk about this technique in sessions, sometimes people come up to me and say, are you kidding me? I have to treat every new wacko idea with points? I'm a, I'm a leader. i got a lot of people reporting to me. I'm a busy person. And my answer is not uh, yes or no. My answer is make sure you recognize that responding to a new idea is an investment in your people. It's an investment in training them. It's an investment in developing them and their ability to understand how you're thinking. It's an opportunity to say, hey, there are some good things to that wacko new idea. There are some opportunities and there are some significant issues that need to be addressed. So every time you take the time to address an idea with a point, you're training, you're developing your people. And that is no, uh, no small thing. And people are looking for uh, development. They're hungry for that. So that's the opportunity that we want to take in order to make sure that we're developing our new folks. So here's your fun fact for the day. Um, Jorn Ekbal, who's a researcher out of Sweden, said something uh, between 20 to 67 percent of the statistical variance accounted for in the climate for creativity in organizations is directly attributed to the behavior of the leader. Well, what the heck does that mean? Right, so we're a research-driven organization. We love that stuff here because everything we do is built on research. And what that says to us is, guess what, folks? If, if people really like what's happening, if they're if they're really engaged, if they're contributing, if they're coming up with new ideas, then something like 20 to 60 or 7 percent of that is directly attributable to you, the leader. That's great news. On the other hand, 
if people don't like what they're doing, if they're not having fun, if they're not engaged, if they're not coming up with innovative new ideas, well, guess what, folks? Something like 20 to 67 percent of that it may well be directly attributable to you, the leader. Now, you've got uh, you've got some wiggle room in there, so you can say, hey, it's not me, it's somebody else, it's another leader, whatever. And it also says that leadership has a huge impact on creativity and innovation. And so here's a couple of things to keep in mind as you think about here's the mindset that's required for innovation leadership. Number one, we talked about this, look for the value in all new ideas. And I would list that as number one. If you do nothing else, if you walk away with nothing else from our time here today, you need to look for the value in all new ideas. That's the number one thing that you can do as a leader of innovation. Number two, there's always one, more than one right answer um, when we're dealing with innovation challenges. Some of those challenges, some of those business thinking challenges, maybe not. There may be one right answer. It may be a yes or a no. It may be safe or unsafe, but it might be right or wrong. But with innovation, there's usually more than one right answer. Third thing, we want to separate our generative thinking from our evaluative thinking. So one of the things to be uh, to get good at is separating uh, generating ideas from evaluating ideas. So being very deliberate about saying, hey, let's generate ideas now. Let's not judge them quite yet. Let's separate that. That's a good way to, to make sure that more innovation is happening. Similarly, we want to be deliberate about separating our innovative thinking from our business thinking, being very deliberate about which one do we need right now. Do we need something new? Do we need to add value? Or do we need to figure out how to make um, this practical, profitable, implementable, workable? Separate our innovative thinking from our business thinking. And thinking about those as two distinct uh, two distinct skill sets. Next thing we want to do is develop that tolerance for ambiguity. Again, that relates to innovation, uh, innovative thinking. The more that we can tolerate the unknown, to hold open the questions, to be more curious, that's where innovation really starts to emerge from that space of ambiguity. Not always easy, um, but it's very valuable. Phrasing problems as questions. Uh, you saw a little bit about that in terms of how we treated the issues and point, and we'll practice that in a moment. And keeping in mind that there's more than one right question. And so we're going to talk about those last two um, right now. When we talk about how do we frame and how do we reframe challenges. So, again, the key to the innovation mindset, there's usually more than one right answer, and there's frequently more than one right question. So, reframing the question uh, is based on the notion that the problem as presented is usually not the challenge that, when solved, will get you to where you want to go. So, we're asking you to consider some alternative ways of looking at the problem. So, here's, a, here's an example that, that I particularly love. Like, I'm not sure if you remember the Ansari X Prize, um, but several years ago, there was a, there was a challenge that was put out there uh, to the world at large um, by an organization that said, you can win $10 million if you can create a, a, a vehicle that will go into space twice in the course of a week. Right? So most folks took a look at that and said, well, let's see, I know that they reused the, the space shuttle. Um, we need to basically design a relaunchable rocket, something that we can get up there uh, twice inside of a week so that we can get that $10 million prize. And a lot of folks were working on that in terms of how do we design a relaunchable rocket. Well, as it turns out, the folks who won that prize, um, uh, designer by the name of Bert Rutan, um, working uh, with the folks from, from uh, Virgin Airlines, came up with a concept that the vehicle itself, you can see at the top of the screen, there's two images that kind of look like a modified, updated version of the space shuttle. But rather than thinking about it as a relaunchable rocket, they rephrased the challenges. How might we get that vehicle close to space, close to the top of the atmosphere? And in fact, they didn't use a rocket. They used something that was far more common and far more reusable, which was a jet airplane. Um, and in fact, so what they used this uh, jet airplane that they called the, the White Knight, um, and the White Knight carried the uh, carried the, the spaceship one, that vehicle, that thing that looks like a space shuttle, carried it to a very high altitude. At that point, they disconnected, and then this uh, the, the shuttle itself, spaceship one, just then shot into space. So uh, much less energy required. There wasn't a lot of burning. There wasn't a lot of fuel. It was just a question of launching this thing like you would any other jet airplane, which happens every day. Um, it lands. You see it's got landing gear. 
just strap it back on again, off you go back into space again. Um, and so this approach helped them win the Ansari X Prize $10 million, and by the way, is the basic uh, framework upon which Virgin Airlines is creating their, uh, their space tourism business. So for $100,000, I believe, is the latest price, you can reserve your spot to go into space for seven minutes on a device that looks an awful lot like that. So uh, another way to think about this is this quote by uh, John Dewey, that a problem is half solved if it's properly stated. So we want to make sure we're framing it the right way. Framing it as a relaunchable rocket may not get you where you need to go, but framing it as how might we get a device uh, close to space that's a different way to think about that challenge. And so that then comes into this whole notion of reframing challenges. So another way to reframe that something that might be a little bit, um, a little more down to earth for you, if you will, is a challenge that I hear from a lot of folks, which is, hey, how am I going to make more money? That's a good problem to be dealt with, um, depending on what your situation is. You can also reframe it in a lot of different ways, framed as a question of how might I save money? Or excuse me, how might I save more money? In what ways might I reduce expenses? How to take an inexpensive vacation? How might I budget more effectively? In what ways might I save more of what I make? How to cut down on spending? How might I retire comfortably? So you'll see that all of those statements on the screen there are very similar. And there are different ways of looking at this challenge of how might I make more money? And it will lead to completely different solutions. Right? If the challenge is I need to take a vacation, well, you could make more money or you could take a, more, a less expensive vacation. That's one way of dealing with that. If it's about, I need to improve my savings, that's a different way to look at it rather than how to make more money, right? So there's a lot of different ways of looking at the same type of challenge depending on what it is that you're really trying to accomplish. So here's some suggestions for how to reframe the challenge. So a good statement of a challenge should be, well, something that you really want to solve. Right, to be very clear about what is it that you really want. It should be a problem that you own or on which uh, you have some influence. In a perfect world, it's concise. It's basically seven to ten words raised as a question free of criteria. It's not about how might I save $10,000 more uh, each month uh, keeping the same job so that I can take a vacation. Right? That's pretty convoluted. We want something concise and free of criteria, because that can be those cri the criteria can be limiting in terms of our thinking. We want to make sure it's affirmative in orientation. What's the stuff that you want, rather than what's the stuff that you don't want? How might I not declare bankruptcy? Okay, let's take a look at that in terms of how might I be financially solvent. That's going to give you more uh, productive solutions to the challenge. We also want to make sure that we're taking a look at who's the owner. Who actually owns this specific problem? Is it me? Is it us? Is it them? Who is it exactly? And again, we want to make sure that we phrase this with what I love this. The researchers call these invitational stems. Um, and an invitational stem is, uh, is a way of starting a question, a stem, to the question that invites solutions. So we've used these before in the point activity. Uh, how to, in what ways might, how might, what might be all the... Um, because there's a big difference between saying something like, I have no money, or in what ways might I obtain money? Two very different ways to approach a challenge. Or saying, hey, there's no time. That's very different than saying, how might we find additional resources? As a leader, pointing out those obstacles shuts down the conversation. Providing the question creates the opportunity to um, provide some answers. So let's do a real quick uh, practice at, uh activity. So let's imagine that we, all of us, all of us on this call have the opportunity to take a vacation, a year-long vacation, on the planet Mars, right? There are some challenges with that, you might admit. Um, and so I'm just going to ask you in your chat box to write a reframe of some of the challenges to be overcome as we think about a one-year vacation on Mars, framing it as a question. How to, and you can abbreviate with H2, in what ways might IWWM, how might HM, or what might be all the WMBAT. So take a moment in the chat box. Would you please uh, enter in some of those specific problem statements, some of those reframes, as you think about how do we take a vacation on Mars for a year? So these are starting to come in. 
Um, so one good reason is how might we take a vacation on Mars? How might I breathe? How might I spend my time? Uh, in what ways might I breathe? Uh, how might E.T. phone home? Very nice. Um, how do you get there? How might we get home? Uh, how might we survive? How might we obtain food? How to get there and back? How to bring enough beer? Uh, how might we finance the trip? How might we get paid for this? How to bring pets? How to clean pets? Um, what might be all the ways to cultivate the planet? Um, how might I bring enough bags? How do we wash our dog on Mars? How might we go fishing? Right. So you'll notice that there's a lot of specific issues in there. Right. If we just start with how to take a vacation on Mars, that's a pretty broad, broad challenge. We've got a lot of reframes in there. Some of them still coming in. How to watch football. These are very important. How do I sell this idea to my husband or wife for significant other? Right. How about we organize tour? There's a lot of challenges to be solved. And so as you think about, you know, some of these big daunting challenges that organizations face, hopefully not getting to Mars and coming back, um, this is a good strategy for making sure that we're uh, letting folks know that they have an opportunity to contribute to the challenge, right? So we want to reframe those um, as the challenge, uh, looking at those using the invitational steps. How to, in what ways might, how might, and what might be all so, um, we've talked about reframing. Hopefully, you can see some value to that in terms of your conversations with your direct reports, with your managers, when things are tough, reframing some of those things in a bunch of different ways, making sure that we're asking the question a lot of different ways to ensure that we're going to end up with the right solution. So, um, I want you to think about, um, think about it from this perspective. So, why bother reframing? Because the problem is presented rarely yields the most innovative answer. Reframing helps to ensure that we're not just focusing on a symptom, but we're focusing more likely to focus on a, uh, the root cause. It ensures agreement on the focus of innovation efforts so that we're not all trying to solve different challenges, and it helps you create more buy-in to the solutions. So, we've talked about a bunch of stuff in the last uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, I'd like you to just take a moment, and in, your, in the chat box, what are some of the key takeaways? What are some of the key things that you're walking away with out of here? Um, and then once you've had that, we'll open it up to some questions. So think about some questions. So some things that folks are taking as key takeaways, look for the value in new ideas, get to the point, uh, this whole thing about praise first, um, this recognition that I may have been inhibiting, uh, inhibiting innovations, um, nice new ideas that were too crazy, need to keep an open mind, got some new tools, points. Uh, reframing, asking the right questions is as important as finding the right solutions, retraining your brain, uh, embracing risk takers, right, clearly defining the opportunity, point well, fantastic. So looks like folks are getting some good value from this. Thank you for sharing those takeaways and hopefully inspiring some takeaways for other folks who are on the webinar. So um, the last thing I'm putting up here, this is a slide that you've already seen, some of these key things from the innovation leadership mindset. Um, you'll have access to this, these slides, of course. So this is here in a couple of different places. These are the key things that we want you to walk away with. Um, so at this point, uh, I'm going to leave up on screen for a little while contact information. So if, you're, if you have questions, if you're interested in what's going on, you can either email them to me or, better yet, Enter your questions in the chat box right now so that we can all, so I can answer them now and we can all get value from them. Um, if you're following Twitter, um, I tweet. I tweet, therefore I am. Uh, I blog occasionally at leadingeffectively.com. Um, the link to the white paper, if you want to send it to your friends and family, uh, the link is right there um, for the white paper. But that's my contact information. So the question is, what, what questions do you have? Um, so one of the questions is, can we get a copy, PDF of the slides? Yes, and that. You have a link in your confirmation email where you use to access today's webinar. That link includes access to the course materials, and that uh, includes the uh, copy of the slides today. Great. So another question is, it seems like reframing is similar to brainstorming. Well, yes, we're actually using the brainstorming technique as we reframe the, the, the problem. So that's clear. The challenge I find with the brainstorming, the question continues, is how to drive to an actual decision. Well, that's a very important question, and that's, that comes back to that issue that we were talking about before in terms of separating a, a generation 
from evaluation. So brainstorming is great for generating a lot of options. We also may need to make sure that we then at some point say, okay, got enough ideas, time to move on. Um, and that's where we get into the decision-making process, where we basically take a look through all of those things to figure out which is the best question to move forward on. And that's part of the group process, the group management process, to drive to the actual decision. Making sure that there is a deliberate intent, that the deliberate outcome of our time together is to make sure we have a specific solution. Um, and so there are some specific techniques to drive to the actual decision. Point, by the way, is a good way to evaluate to make sure we've got the right ideas or the right challenges. Question, do we have any posters that we can post in the office with points? Um, well, if you want to uh, take that, uh, that slide and blow it up, um, feel free to do so. Um, we don't have anything that we can specifically send to you in terms of posters. Um, but feel free to make them using a flip chart and some markers, just copying the slide in there that details the steps of points. Uh, let's see, uh, can we use points with people who live in a default negative mode, for example, senior management? Great question. Um, and so one of the things to think about with point is a great way to treat ideas when people present ideas to you. Um, also a great way to predict the resistance that sometimes comes up with some of those default negative thinkers. So when you're going into management with your own ideas, saying, hey, here's my idea that's an uh, interesting new idea for a vending machine. Um, here's the things that I like about the idea. What do you like about that idea? You can facilitate them through the conversation. Here are some of the opportunities that I see. Do you see any opportunities with this? Here are some of the issues that we're still trying to work our way through. Do you see some specific issues? And if there are some big issues, you can then ask folks, you know, well, all right, so senior manager, help me think this through. So you can use it not just uh, when you're talking, but you can use it, also use it to frame a conversation whether that's with a team, whether that's with your direct reports, or whether it's your managers. Also very useful to provide the rationale in your presentation. Here's the idea. Here are the pluses, opportunities, issues, the new thinking. Um, what else do you have to contribute to that? Um, and we have seen folks uh, very covertly in the meeting do a great job of saying, hey, guys, it sounds like uh, the immediate reaction to the idea is let's attack it. Let's, um, let's look for the value of it first to see if there's anything good that we want to keep even as the idea changes. So you can use point in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different ways. So let's see, some other questions. Um, Have you balanced the tolerance for ambiguity and the inability to make a decision? Ah, good. So, um, and, and I think that's a really important question. Unfortunately, I don't know the formula for that except to say that those are two very distinct modes, right? Uh, and so there is that time to be in the ambiguity, to explore, to be curious, to continue to look. But at some point, we need to get out of that mode and say, all right, let's evaluate, let's judge. Um, uh, one of my colleagues talks about the uh, the good idea cutoff point, the acronym being the guy cop. Um, and what he will sometimes say is, you know what, we are now past the, good, the guy cop. We are now past the good idea cutoff point. And so some of that has to do with how do you manage the project? How much time do you have? Is it, is it we've got an hour for both? We want to make sure that we've saved, you know, a lot of time for decision making. Is it a two-month project? Is it a three-year project? Um, we want to make sure that we're being very deliberate about saying, how much do we, how much time do we allow the ambiguity? How much time do we say we need to save time for decision making? Other questions? Question from um, Chuck. How do you avoid the perception of not dealing with the reality of problems by reframing it? Mm. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. And I think that if we're doing an effective job of reframing the problem properly, then we can help people see that uh, this is uh, either a different problem to be solved or a specific problem to be solved, rather than somebody coming in and saying, hey, you know what, there's no money in the budget. Um, if we can reframe it and saying, well, how might we find money in the budget? One response to that would be, hey, you're not dealing with the issue. The other response is to say, oh, okay, let's do some collaborative problem solving and figure out some ways that we can actually find some ways to make this more affordable. Um, and so some of that depends on how you position it. And if you're just saying, oh, no, 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 it's not, this, there's not a problem, here's a question instead, um, this is about saying how do we engage people um, in the conversation. So, some great questions in here, folks. Um, we need to wrap up the conversation because you've got places to go, I imagine. Um, so, I want to say thank you very much for being here. And I also want to uh, strongly encourage you 
to take the opportunity to put this stuff to the test, to apply uh, leadership as you start to look at innovation in your organization, and to apply that which we've talked about. Um, and so my challenge to you is to find a way to use points um, in the next 24 hours or so, or to reframe a problem in the next 24 hours. That, my friends, is your homework assignment for today. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Tracy. I'm going to say thanks, folks, for your participation. Thank you, Jonathan, for contributing to the Center's Leading Effectively webinar series and helping our audience um, learn how to lead in their organization. We'll stay online for about five more minutes, so if you have any other questions for Jonathan, feel free to send those into the chat. Um, before you leave, we ask you to complete the evaluation that we've pushed out to you. We do value your feedback. So, again, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, and we look forward to your attendance at a future Leading Effectively webinar.